All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios. Delighted as always to bring you another episode here on all your podcast platforms and on YouTube and other ways to watch as well. I'm joined now by a special guest who's worked in the media and sports industry in particular for uh, quite some time. Don't want to, you know, say exactly how long or date you too much, but <laughs> NFL Network, I uh, worked for the Raiders. I even saw Ultimate Surf there in your bio. And Tennis Channel, you can see her now on the break as well as some other outstanding work on the Believe in Rams podcast. Erin Coscarelli, welcome to the show. Mitch, I just had a <laughs> birthday too, so I'm really over the, the hill, it feels like. Um, no, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that is uh, quite the resume. And it's funny, I was thinking about, you know, when I came in today, how lucky we are that we get to do this for a living, right? I mean, yeah. we, we, it's like not a job. It feels like a pinch me moment that we're here, we're in Santa Monica, we get to cover this amazing sport. And I really love like the storytelling elements. And yeah. we'll get into all of that, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, it's uh, especially being in the location. I know it's part of your backstory. You're from here, so you don't have you didn't have to, I guess, dream to go far away. <laughs> and I'm assuming growing up, you were and I and I saw your your bio. The word competitive came up a lot. You were a competitive kid, uh -huh. always like following in your brothers and your family's footsteps. But was that just the drive that was in you? And then sports, obviously, becoming a part of that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think I was. Very fortunate to, like you said, I grew up in Los Angeles. I stayed close. I went to USC. I got into USC football just by virtue of being the talkative kid in Spanish class. And someone's like, you're outgoing. Do you want to interview uh, the football team? And at the time, it was Reggie Bush, Pete Carroll. So, I mean, it was like LA didn't have a pro football team. USC football, that was, the Trojans were the team. Like And that time was... Like, it was basically like Dodgers, Lakers have always had this fan base, but they were right on par. Like, USC football was the talk of town. Yeah, yeah. For younger listeners that, it, it, you guys have, if I don't mind saying, have fallen on a little harder times in the last couple of years. Yeah. But early 2000s, it was the talk yeah, of town. Yeah, 2006, 2007, you know, then they went through the sanctions, not to go hardcore <laughs> Trojan <laughs> history for all you folks that may <laughs> not like USC. You're either either like you love USC or you hate USC. It's There's so like funny. like the casual LA, like yeah. support everyone that's like, oh, yeah. UCLA basketball and USC football. We don't really trust those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, and then I was just fortunate, you know, I, I loved people. My dad was a salesman um, and he was just like the most gregarious person. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit of his personality. And then of course, yeah, I, I grew up a total tomboy. I had two older brothers. Sports were always on TV. Like you said, the mm -hmm. Lakers, the Dodgers, they like bled blue. <laughs> And, you know, to be able to infuse both passions where I get to tell the stories of pro athletes, I always say I'm not a sports broadcaster. Maybe I'm a psychologist that I just study people who happen to play sports. And that's what fascinates me the most mm -hmm. because sports, in my opinion, are a microcosm of real life, right? If you feel pressure in yeah. the batter's box or when you're playing tennis or, you know, it's fourth and one, the game's on the line, Yes, because you can do it in front of millions of fans doesn't mean that you and I don't feel pressure or right. nervousness when mm -hmm. we're in a board meeting or we're in a production meeting mm -hmm. or there's something important for us. Like, I think all of that is just real life stuff. Yeah. And to tell the story through the athlete mindset is, is always so fascinating. I mean, did you feel like it was something you always wanted to do in the sports field? It sounds like you were an extrovert your whole life. Yeah. You were, and that got you the, the gig with USC football, but as you're going through and getting into a prestigious USC school, was working in sports and working on camera always in the mainframe? It or? wasn't. Wow. <clears throat> there was no like Aaron Andrews when I first started. Yeah. So, you know, now it's so much more popular, mm -hmm. especially as a woman to be in sports broadcasting. And, you know, I, I am so grateful for all the women who forged ahead of me to pave the way, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to do something that, I was passionate about. And I think at the end of the day, the thing I'm definitely most passionate about is connecting with people, mm -hmm. finding ways to relate, right? right? Like <clears throat> I can't relate to Tom Brady or I can't relate to Federer, yeah. but I can relate to, you know, who those people are at home, what mm -hmm. they, how they live their lives, their, their values, their morals, their character. In fact, actually it was really funny. I don't know if you caught the <laughs> roast. <laughs> the Tom yeah, Brady yeah. roast, but I was so happy that he was willing, Tom Brady was willing to sort of put himself out there uh -huh. in a way where I'm like, okay, you know, sometimes it's okay to get like teased yeah. and made fun of. Yeah. 
and show these personalities. And that's what I love doing. Right. And there's a lot of like negatives that have come with more information, more technology apps and certain platforms. But one of the best things that it is it has humanized a lot of people. And that's a credit to, you know, individuals like yourself that have worked in the industry to tell the human interest stories because I'm old enough to remember when you didn't even have that, when you just had athletes on the field and you didn't know much about them. You had to dig for info and you didn't really know what was true. It's good to kind of see them and, you know, understand what they're really about. Isn't that so interesting, right? That like you kind of get to peel back a layer of them that social media allows because even, you know, you as a broadcaster mm-hmm. or myself as a broadcaster, there's a part of me like coming to you today. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh God, I'm nervous because I don't <laughs> well, really I mean. like being on the other end <laughs> yeah. of the mic. I don't right. really love being like interviewed so much because I'm so used to being in control, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's an element of getting comfortable. And it's the same thing with pro athletes. Pro athletes, like you said, they would show up, they would maybe they do their commercial, they they do their work, they, you know, mm-hmm. um, try to win at the end of the day, but you didn't get a pick perspective of who these people were outside of the game that they played and it's the same thing for me like there's parts of me that I'm like should I show this on social media should I show even the hardships you know and I think I'm really grateful when we see like a Naomi Osaka or just athletes in general yeah Michael Phelps is another one where they're like hey it's I've I've gone through hard times and I'm okay and I think when we see people we Mm -hmm. look up to have the ability to kind of admit they're struggling gives right. it's like relieves a lot of pressure for sure and and even to a lesser degree because it's not as important but to separate the competitor from the person mm. someone who's in the name frame in tennis right now like daniel collins mm-hmm. nasty competitor and i mean that in a compliment but we're seeing the personality come out it's her last year on tour and we're seeing how she has a job to do mm-hmm. you're in between the lines you have to win you're you're a competitor it's nasty out there you're fighting but i'll off the you know, off the court, she has a dog, she has this family life, she has this bubbly personality. That was something else I don't think you get without those human interest stories and social media and the chance of the athletes to get interviewed to, you know, showcase that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, I think athletes these days are, are, are wanting to be featured mm-hmm. that way. You know, like a lot of my girlfriends, they're like, oh, you cover <laughs> sports for a living. Like, how do you, do, you know, football It's like some, you know, some yeah. of my girlfriends aren't f- familiar with the sport, but what they love is like the hard knocks. Mm -hmm. They love the element of these players, like you said, Danielle Collins showing a side of herself that maybe you're not necessarily seeing (laughs) when you're on the court, right? Yeah, Yeah, there are people that watch hard knocks. I feel like they just assume that team wins the Super Bowl every year. That's like their (laughs) football intake. So, you know, USC, and I want to get to that because you go to school there and there's different paths. Like I took the complete opposite path, like a smaller school. Mm -hmm. But you're at this place that has a well-earned pedigree for being one of the best schools, one of the best universities for getting people in the sports industry. Mm -hmm. There's opposite pressures though with that. You have to work so much harder, I feel like, at school to separate yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you can make it through and and put yourself out there and do great work, that does kind of give you a leg up in finding your footing in your first professional gig. Yeah, yeah, and it's so interesting too. I'm gonna be hosting a panel for USC Sports and Entertainment and I'm bringing on these sort of experts in the industry. And the question I even ask now is how does one get into the broadcast industry, right? Like I went to USC, Annenberg School. You know, you said you went to a small uh, small school, but what you traditionally would do in sports broadcasting mm-hmm. is you would go to a small market. You'd go to, mm-hmm. you know, a really small town, do everything there, and then hopefully graduate into a bigger market and so on and so forth. When I was at USC, I was fortunate because I got everything I needed, almost like I went to a small market mm-hmm. because they have what's called Annenberg TV News. So <laughs> ATV, a- 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 Annenberg TV News. Yeah, ATVN. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> it's been that long <laughs> since I've graduated right. from college. <laughs> and uh, I was lucky that I did radio there. Like, you, you know, like I mentioned, the football team was excellent. So I got all these sort of things out of the way that m- most may have to go to a small market to do. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're in LA. I was very lucky. I got an agent, which that never happens mm-hmm. when you're like right out of college. And then, you know, I got a, a, like, I got super lucky. I started covering the World Series of Poker for ESPN back wow. in 2008. And then the rest is history. And what I will say, Mitch, is also for people looking to break into the industry, 
treat everyone kind because what I will say is the relationships I had with not just the producers who continued to hire me, but the crew that I was mm -hmm. with, if you're good to pe people are always watching. First of all, just be nice in general. Right. It doesn't matter who's watching, Life but lesson. people will always be. And, and you don't know who's going to be on the way up or on the way down either. Like that's my, part of my, it too. My social media producer <laughs> at NFL was a social media producer. And now she's like a juggernaut in the industry. <laughs> she owns like a media, a media company, a brand company. And she's still a very good friend of mine. We know her. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I remember like, if you really were like, oh, you're like, you have this, this job. It, it, you're absolutely right, Mitch. If yeah. you just treat people with respect, regardless of where they end up, like, you're, right. you're, you're in good company, but also remember <laughs> they may end up somewhere. <laughs> Great advice to remember. Yeah. Shout know. out, shout out to our friend, Heather Pink. And Heather. I just, I just say too, you know, I have stories about her, but she has stories about me, so I can't <laughs> yeah. share any of them. Uh, yeah, but no, it, it's a great lesson. And I was just more fascinated with the d differences because there's different paths to this. My school, you know, shout out my school, St. Louis university, not a small school, but small in terms of underdeveloped in the media sense. Mm -hmm. But I had freedom to try stuff. I was able to get on air quickly. I had to find different lanes and different ways and grind, really, and balance stuff. But I think that having a formal training at a school like USC just prepares you so well because we've, I've seen a lot of the USC people that come through, and it's polished. Like you were, you were getting the chance to be trained to be on the air right away. So I think, it's, I think it's good. Was that first break, though? And I know you worked in NFL, but what was the first actual on-air gig like real professional job well and i want to go back really quickly because what advice would you give people that are younger because you're younger than me you know yeah I'm by not, a little bit by, <laughs> by probably a lot but you know you've been, you've made it you've 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 carved a path which is impressive for you how do you think people do it now right in the broadcast world because it's so different there's more opportunity to have the beginning of careers, I would say, there's more skills to be learned. That would be my lesson. Um, I kind of learned it through the back end of production, editing, producing stuff before on air became a possibility. I would say hone as many different skills as possible. The small market path, and and I don't begrudge anybody for doing it. And you know, my goals were never to be an on air news personality, sports anchor personality. But I would say that might pigeonhole you into just that path. I think there's a lot of different opportunities you can take that you don't know. I mean, I never thought podcasts would be the full way I would go. So I would say try to learn as many skills and don't be afraid to do what I do and just take the plunge and move out here for a gig at NFL Network that led to this. Yeah. And I mean, you can do more things now, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have a really, you'll probably see a really cool final edit of this, but you have <laughs> iPhones you know, propped up well Just and a little bit of lighting back. and it looks amazing, you <laughs> yeah. know, and that's like the yeah. thing that you can do now is you don't have to go to a super polished school to get the experience, like you said, you mm -hmm. know, but you have to be driven and you asked a question about USC and I yeah. don't really remember what it was. I was just wondering more <laughs> of like the first gig when you first. Oh, the first gig was World Series of Poker. Yeah. Oh, so well, that was the, the very first, first one. the first gig gig, which wasn't yeah. really a gig. And the other thing yeah. I will recommend to young people is if you're in college, try to do a lot of internships. I worked at MTV News back when MTV News was a thing, Fox Sports West. MTV and then News. Metro Goldwyn Mayor John Goldwyn was the producer of oh god what was that dexter that dexter <laughs> movie i realized i got a lot of i didn't like this and i was able to get closer to i actually do like this hence the the sports realm um but my first job out of college was actually eyewitness news channel 7 i was a prompter roller i did scripts i and by the way it was from midnight to like 7 a.m i wanted to oh, yeah. cry working in an overnight shift which by the way i also did at nfl network for a long time um, and then after that, I was there for like a year. I got my, my job with ESPN. I moved to Vegas. I did the uh, World Series of Poker. Wow. And then after that, it was X Games, Pop Warner Super Bowl. And I just kind of stayed with that production. Because yeah. like I said, you know, if you get in well and mm -hmm. you treat people with kindness and respect and you work hard, I also think if you work hard, that can replace just someone who's incredibly talented mm -hmm. like if you show you're willing to work and then you you know you care about people around you you're passionate about the sport you're passionate about what you do i think that goes a long way passion and professionalism huge things and you said something too i mean you were on a fast track you had these opportunities that you earned but you also had to sacrifice early call times not ideal shifts that's part of the game too i mean it's 
it's kind of like paying your dues. If you put it out there in sports, you're the rookie on the team, you're, you know, the low level on the totem pole. It's part of what you have to do. And in, in the end, I think you'd agree, it builds character too that you're willing to do all that. Yeah. Yeah. Like you got to roll your sleeves up, be willing to get dirty, be willing mm-hmm. to carry your own stuff. Like I always get a little annoyed if I see they call them talent, by the way. I'm like, you're just like everyone else. Like just roll up your sleeves. Let's. I think it's unfortunate that a few, because I've had experiences and I would say mostly it's been pretty good. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes me rare. It's just my own experience. Mm-hmm. But it's unfortunate that a few bad apples with maybe egos have kind of ruined the bunch because it's not clearly like that. Like we know that there's a lot of humble, hardworking people in in TV that are talent, but unfortunately a few bad apples have given a reputation out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember (laughs) when I was just really, when I was young and I was interning, I just remembered there were the, like you said, really great, (laughs) epic kind. And then I would be privy to seeing some that I didn't like how they treated people. And I remember going, I do not want to be like that. Mm -hmm. It was a really great learning lesson. In fact, actually Dallas Reigns, when I worked at Eyewitness News, would come in and he would say hi to the interns and remember everybody's names. And I was like, oh my God, if I ever become anything, I want to be somewhat similar if I can to treat people that way. There's people here and I don't like singling people out good or bad. Good because then it's like you should single everyone out. But there's some real big tennis champions here. They're just the nicest people. And I just think like, how can anyone have an ego if they don't, but uh, more, more with Aaron Coscarelli here on tennis channel inside and talking about her career. And then we're going to get to some of the work in tennis that you've been doing, but I did want to get to one other thing first. You've been on the front lines and folk very vocal about mentor mentorship, how it's important to you, especially in the female side, that it was kind of something that was lacking when you were coming up and you're looking to pay it forward. When and why did that become such a, such a passionate endeavor for you? You know, I think when I really wanted and needed some support, I was given it at least in the beginning by really incredible men. Um, and I was fortunate that they were willing to take chances on me, right? Uh, most mm-hmm. of the time, I mean, yeah. you know, when I first started, it was very male dominated. It's mm-hmm. changed now. And knowing and wishing I had more female mentorship at the time, now I think it's 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. We're seeing it so much more often. I just wish I would have had more female mentorship in the way of going, hey, you know, I'm going through this or I'm feeling this way or how much yeah. should I negotiate or what, how do I, how do I yeah. interact with this interview? And it was just different, you know, and I think when there's few and far women in those roles, you a, just don't have the opportunity mm-hmm. and also it's competitive, right? So, you know, whereas maybe there's more male seats at the table for me, when I first started, there were very few mm-hmm. and I don't want that to be the case for other women as right. they progress. I want to be for them a safe place they can come, whether they're feeling any kind of way. You know, a lot of times for sure, I felt like a fish out of water being like covering, you know, professional football, A, not playing it was hard to really wrap my head around. Like, how can I cover it in the way that that the audience deserves? And what I started doing was, I'm gonna just be the fan. Mm -hmm. I'm representing a fan. I am not representing an analyst. I stopped trying to be an analyst. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is too, for people that are listening, which is nice because, you know, with tennis, doing more tennis, I'm grateful I get to cover women. You know, that I enjoy. But what I will say is when I covered NFL, in the event I ever got a stat wrong or a name pronounced incorrectly, I get judged differently than you would. Mm -hmm. And that means you have to step, it's just what it is. You know, you have to step your game up even more. You have to be really prepared. And, you know, like I said, I think we're starting to see so much change in this industry. Um, But it was just how it was when I first started out. Yeah, and that's powerful stuff because you're, so you're telling the story also going back to what you said originally there was no Aaron Andrews type when you started so this is like the start of a new genre like we're still in you know middle age of all this really happening so there needs to be development with everything and it's good that people like yourself are paying it forward because you know that's how it really starts it starts with people established people on the top picking people up on the bottom because when you're starting out you can't like seek out a mentor like firmly you know yeah. it has to be on the kindness and graciousness of people like yourself. Yeah. I always, Mitch, wanted to get to the top of the mountain as fast as I could. And it's really lonely there by yourself. And what I started to realize when I had some challenges, setbacks, personal loss, Mm -hmm. had to deal with grief, Mm -hmm. went into therapy, um, 
I really realized the place I want to be is to really genuinely support people and right. be in service, which is why I love what I do, mm -hmm. right? Because if I could be any type of conduit, whether mm -hmm. it's my personal story or Danielle Collins' personal mm -hmm. story or Naomi Osaka's, like if that's helping someone else right. at home, right? We listen to music and people go, oh my God, that song changed my life. Like, it's true. Like if it can resonate a story, mm -hmm. whether what you're going through, what I'm going through, if it can help someone at home, yeah. like I'm for that. Were you always someone that felt like you could use, you know, personal trauma and personal issues to speak out and be helpful? Cause there's no, I mean, again, there's no right or wrong way to handle grief, but you're one of those people that is very vocal about, okay, I'm yeah. going to use my trauma to help someone else. Yeah. Was that always no, part of you? I would hide <laughs> any yeah. type of insecurity. <laughs> yeah vulnerability, uh, lack of knowledge, anything that didn't present as though I had everything together. And then I realized when I had certain personal, you know, setbacks, yeah. right? I, I lost my second brother mm -hmm. in COVID. I'd lost a brother in college. Mm -hmm. And then my father passed away a year later. It was a lot of loss. Right. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Like, I didn't know how to recover right. in a way where I was able to do my job. I was like, not really keeping it together. And I was like, I needed support. And all the people that were there for me, it really showed me that I was like, oh my God, like, it's okay to say you're having an off day. And being vocal, mm -hmm. I learned people are like, oh my God, thank you. For, I'm going through this mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, yeah, it was something that I had to learn. I thought I needed to be like perfect and flawless and never have a, you know, quote unquote bad day. And I'm like, really kind of liking the person that I am today, all the flaws, all the battle mm -hmm. scars. And yeah. you know, if it helps someone, right. that's amazing. No, it, it really does. And you never even know when or what you say. Uh, like could be a, a throwaway line that you think in your head, that could be the line that helps people or gets people to a better place. It has to be special, especially from your perspective to see how it's in vogue now, how athletes are willing to speak up, how it's not taboo to acknowledge that they have issues and take time away when they need to, as I call it, get off the hamster wheel when sports or life is just too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a game kids love when they're young and then somehow they get older and it becomes, you know, they're almost like the anointed ones that have these, uh, this unbelievable talent and skill. And then it becomes like their livelihood, right? I mean, Michael Phelps is a great story. You should watch the weight of gold <laughs> documentary if you have it. You know, he didn't really realize who he was. And it's the challenge with the athlete, right? I, I love having these conversations because I'm yeah. also wrapped up in it where maybe my identity was for a long time my job or like, you know, <laughs> yeah. what what I did. And, um, and you're not as present because that's another thing I read about some of your stuff is that you're focusing more on being present with what you do and how you live outside of your professional career. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, when you can, when you are a professional athlete and you're like, this is who I am. Well, yeah. then how do you feel when that thing goes away? Right. I mean, mm. Tom Brady is another great <laughs> example of he retired for 40 days, had to come back mm -hmm. because he was so entrenched in, I'm a competitor and I'm a football player and I get it. It's seductive. It's provocative, you know, and like, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard if you think that's all you right. are. And if you're like, are you, do you still love it? Or is it like right. you're addicted? I mean, you know, I don't know. I just think yeah. all of these things mm -hmm. talking about it is interesting to me. There's no right or wrong. Not just because this is a tennis podcast, but the Marty Fish on told really mm -hmm. stood out to me because, you know, I knew the story about him. I didn't quite know the mental health breakdown that he had. You, you heard stories, but his perspective and he had never been a top 10 player. He worked as hard as he's ever worked in anything, which is saying something, mm -hmm. lost weight, played all the time, mm -hmm. got to a point, got there, and then eventually the mental health took over. And, and I get it. You watch that story. You're like, this is what happens. I mean, it's, it's tough, but it's good to see that there's more support as well, more people like yourself speaking out, normalizing, saying it's okay to not be okay. So, uh, again, great work there. Uh, I did want to, you know, I didn't want to end this. I did want to end this on some positive vibes too, because I'm a big fan of the break here on tennis channel, what you Yay. guys are doing. And I think you could speak to this more, but the, you know, cultural side of tennis too, where it's not just about the match results, but talking about the storylines, talking about the crossover appeal, some of the brand sponsorships, it seems like the players themselves are brands nowadays, but it's good to, 
as I was talking to Steve Weissman, see tennis is kind of having a moment in the mainframe, and I think that's going to keep continuing to happen. It is having a moment, and it is so amazing when you see these athletes, really, like you said, it's like almost it's them. It's who mm -hmm. they are, right? I mean, today we're doing a version of Federer and his partnership with Uniqlo, and I just love that, like you said, you know, the Challengers movie. You're definitely <laughs> seeing tennis having a moment, and hopefully – for for a really long time tennis is such a an incredible sport to to watch but also be immersed in and get to go to you know indian wells right. or just like bask in the celebration of it and it's yeah. what brings people together and it's such an amazing sport rooted in so much tradition right mm -hmm. um so yeah mm -hmm. I, I i i love coming in the break is is a kind of a pop culture take on you know what's happening in the world of tennis and i love the collaborations like you said whether we're featuring a player and what they're up to or what the player is wearing yeah. <laughs> it's all a thing and it's yeah. it's i it's why i love what we're doing right it's 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 like the main <laughs> story of 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 tennis i love it i always thought tennis had a lot of untapped potential untapped resources would be a better way to put it because there's so much good about it that maybe wasn't being broadcast or, or spotlighted in a way the fashion outfits, so many people that say, oh, they love, you know, even men and women that are like, oh, I like the tennis outfits, but they don't know more about it. Now everyone's kind of getting in the mainframe with that. And, you know, the fact that there is opportunities out there, and I'll say it, for females, mm -hmm. it is the most profitable sport that there is. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great thing. Obviously, we can all do better, but there is no sport in the world that can make women more money than tennis. And <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Tennis is... is Tennis is, I'm going to say it, Mitch, tennis is a vibe. It is. It's and, a vibe. <laughs> and, I, and I think there's no, you know, there's no right, what, right or wrong way to consume it. There's no certain types of fans, and I get it. Within sports, you, you see this as well, too. It's a point I wanted to highlight. There's aspects of being a sports fan that maybe aren't for everybody, but that's okay, too. You know, there might be people that watch on the outside for, you know, the outfits and, and everything in that regard, and people that love Challengers, the movie, or might not like it. It's... I think having more options. The NFL is exploding because they're just widening their net. Taylor Swift effect. Yeah, and I get it. It's not for everybody. It's probably not, you know, I'm, I was watching football before. I don't think that swayed me to watch more of it. Uh, but I think, it, you know, widening your net is always a good thing. I think other leagues and other sports can take, you know, lessons from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, you know, I think why we love watching tennis or football or whatever is it – unifies us mm -hmm. right it brings us together it, it allows for us to sort of escape with whatever craziness in the day-to-day -day life that we're going through and it had been crazy for the last three <laughs> years thank god yeah. you know we were able to keep sports on tv for the most part because we needed to escape mm -hmm. and tennis of all things it's such a fun sport to be outside and play with your friends and compete and right. Um, and yeah, I, I feel very <laughs> fortunate coming into this office in Santa Monica. The escapism in sports is really true. Uh, I just finished reading a book about the World War II baseball that like Ted Williams and them played. And it was controversial at the time because they're like, why are we wasting resources on baseball? But the general public loved it because they wanted that distraction from, you know, how you know, the gruesome parts of war. So um, I thought that was uh, phenomenal. I did want to wrap up with some of your other projects, though, Aaron Crosscarelli. It's been great here on tennis channel inside in chat and with you uh the podcast with the rams i've seen you've been getting some big yeah. guests it's been uh pretty exciting uh how did that come to be and uh, what's the most uh enjoyable part of that you know i i really love like you know it it, it, it just again fell in my lap mm -hmm. i'm so grateful that people think of me um and want to work with me i never take that for granted um, I love what I do. I love featuring athletes. I love advocating for athletes. You know, we had the whole <laughs> Saquon Barkley drama where Giants fans are so <laughs> angry at him. And I'm like, you guys need to pump the brakes right now. Um, no, but I, I love it. It fell in my lap. Um, I got to, you know, cover my hometown team with mm -hmm. the Rams and tell the story. And there's such an interesting story right now. If, you know, if you follow the NFL, just what they're going to do without Aaron Donald, they made the playoffs last last year they have you know i think 
what Matthew Stafford's 36. It's like just so fun to kind of cover a little bit of the yeah. drama. Um, and then, you know, I get these cool guests like Ian Rappaport. Ian Rappaport mm -hmm. is our NFL insider who is like nonstop married to his phone. And I asked him the craziest place he'd ever broken news on a chairlift, like the Tom <laughs> Telesco news with the Raiders. And, you know, it's just like, I love stuff like that. Yeah, when we yeah. can kind of like oddly enough humanize right. just what we do in some way. I think that is something that I think people really enjoy. Well, I enjoy it. I Thank appreciate you. you coming on the show. This was a blast. We'll have to do this again. I know that, yeah. uh, you know, you had a birthday. It was one of those what they call milestone, but yeah. you're just getting warmed up career wise. So there's still a lot, uh, you know, down the pipe for you. But Aaron Coscarelli, always welcome here. Phenomenal work on the break. Thanks for coming on Tennis Channel Inside In. Thank you for having me, Mitch. I appreciate it.